You're listening to a Thames Estuary Partnership podcast celebrating London's famous tidal river. We hope you enjoy it. Hello and a warm welcome back to Talk of the Thames. I'm your host, Chloe Russell. Joining me on today's episode is Thames Water Sustainability Director Richard Aylard. In this conversation, Richard and I talk about a range of different topics, but they all start from the beginning. What does he get up to in his job? The climate pledge Thames Water has, and all things Thames Tideway Tunnel, including the history of the Great Stink in 1958, all the way to the future goals of the River Thames in 200 years' time. I hope you enjoy listening. Hello, Richard. A big warm welcome to Talk of the Thames. How are you? Thanks, Chloe. I'm fine. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Good. It's an absolute honour to be talking with you. When I heard the Director of Sustainability at Thames Water, I became really excited. Starting from the top, to any of us that aren't familiar with the full spectrum of Thames Water, can you give us an overview of what the company's mission is? Yeah, the company provides clean water to around 10 million people across London and the Thames Valley, and it treats the wastewater of about 15 million. So our operating area is 4,000 square miles, which takes us from Essex and Kent in the east right through to Gloucestershire in, in the west, and covering a large part of Greater London, certainly in terms of the wastewater, um, and a lot of the Thames Valley, almost as far west as the source of the Thames. So it's a big, it's a big area aligned with the Thames catchment. Excellent. And when we look at your job title, sustainability is such a buzzword nowadays. Mm. In layman's terms, how would you unpack your title and what do you get up to in your role? Well, I think the first thing to say is there's, I don't think there's any such thing as a sustainable company. What we have, what we can be is a more sustainable company. And of course, we're, we are, we are learning and going further each, each year as new technologies, new innovations come online. But we can certainly be as sustainable as possible in the, both in the way we operate the business and provide the services that we have to provide, but also in the way that we do them. It's not just what you do. It's how you do it is really important in terms of sustainability. So it's things like looking at all of the the options there are some situations where to do the job we have to pour concrete um that's uh, reality of of operating in densely populated area like like central london very difficult to find space to do nature-based solutions there are other areas where we can do all sorts of things and of course the basis the basis of water treatment and wastewater treatment is all natural processes you know we use natural processes to treat the water all right, yes, we top it up with chlorine uh, a little, little bit just to keep it safe. And on the wastewater side, again, you know, we use um, bugs, oxygen, sunlight to treat waste wastewater. So we are very closely aligned with the natural environment and natural processes just as, as part of the business. Mm, that's so interesting. I'd love to just touch on that. Did you mention bugs in the treatment system? I haven't heard of that before. What you do is you, you use what's called activated sludge. Huh. which contains bacteria, and the bacteria then treats the next incoming. It's a sort of continuous pro process whereby the way we explain it to school children, and it actually makes sense for adults too, is the good bugs eat the bad bugs. <laughs> um, but in the process, what you do is you, renew, re you reduce the ammonia levels, you reduce the biochemical oxygen demand, such that what you do put in the river has the least possible Im impact on the environment. I mean, it makes total sense. A lot of the times when you put things into layman's terms it does go into children's terms and if it makes sense for them why wouldn't it make sense to us right well a lot of what i'm trying to do is it, it's one thing for thames water to have a great idea and want to do something but ultimately it's our customers that are that are paying for it uh, and we're doing it in an environment and in and around communities i mean we're literally networked into everybody's house mm -hmm. you know we provide pharmaceutical grade tap water to the upstairs floor of every home um, and that's quite a responsibility. <laughs> yeah. And equally, we, we have to collect up, um, not just what comes out. Pe pe when people think about sewage and wastewater, they tend to think about what comes out of toilets. But, of course, it's also showers, baths, washing machines, dishwashers, everything that comes out of the house mm. has to be uh, taken away uh, and treated safely. And what we do is we, we generate e energy 
uh, fr- from the solid part of it. Clean water goes back in the river, and what's left, which we call sludge, uh, once it's been digested for energy, what's left is a valuable soil improver and fertilizer and can go to farmland. So that's the sort of basics of the. So, really, you know, if you think back to learning about the water cycle at school, we're involved right through that from the rain falling, capturing it, storing it, treating it, supplying it. <laughs> Lovely customers make it all dirty again, collect it, <laughs> clean it, put it back in the environment, you know, and then it comes, falls as rain again. So, the water cycle is really very much part of what we do. Right. You're so knowledgeable about this role. Where did this. Was this your background? Where did, where did you? Where did the passion come from? Well, I suppose really going back a very long time, even before I was at school, my, my my grandmother was very interested in natural history. So when you know my my classmates were kicking footballs around, I was collecting wildflowers oh, um, that's so nice. uh, and watching birds <laughs> and things. And it's oh. been been part of my life really. Um, I started started fishing in my teens, and I then studied freshwater biology at university. Then a bit of a move out of that into the Navy for a long time, but gradually got back to my my roots and the things that I'm most interested in. That's so lovely. It's so nice that you can come back to it. Well, it's like a really lovely feedback loop. Yes. Well, it's quite interesting because I was actually at Reading University. Um, yeah. So having then gone off and joined the Navy and gone around the world a few times, I'm now actually back in Reading again, which is our headquarters. Oh, really? Um, just wow. about a, mile, a mile away from where I was at university. So right. it's, um, wow. But, I, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated by the whole natural processes that underpin a water company um, mm-hmm. and how you actually provide a service to society with as little environmental impact as possible. And we're never going to be able to run a water business without some impact. And we, we, we need to take clean water out of the natural environment mm-hmm. for our customers to use. So, you know, that, there's no question that water would be better left in the natural environment. But having taken it out, it's our job to then supply it, clean it up, put it back in again in as pristine a condition as we can. Of course. That, that's more difficult in some situations than others, but that's, that's, mm. that's, that's the challenge is how you run the business um, as efficiently as possible. Because, you know, some of our customers, a lot of our customers care passionately about the environment, but others just want water to come out of the tap. They just want, they don't want to know any of the fancy stuff. Just turn the tap, it comes out, flush the toilet, it goes away again. That's all they care about. And that's, yeah. that's that's their right. That's, you know, they're, they are they are customers. They're paying for a service. Yeah. But what we find when we look at it is that the number of people who are kind of really taking a sort of top-down interest in Thames water as such is is pretty limited. What they're interested in is is what's going into the river from their local sewage works. Does the water taste good? Is the pressure right? Are there leaks? Does the local pumping station flood? Is the odour from the sewage works? Are, there, are, are we digging up the roads more than we need to? It's very much those local issues are, are, are where this becomes real for people. And that's why, you know, although we are looking after 4,000 square miles and people think, well, you can never talk to all the people who want to talk to you. Actually, you can if you, if you make the effort. So we have to be approachable, responsive. I mean, I spent the morning taking some counsellors around one of our big sewage treatment works. Did you? I'll be, I'll be at a public meeting uh, in Oxfordshire tomorrow night, talking about again wastewater issues. Uh-huh. That's 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 what the job's all about. Because if you you know you can't do this in isolation. You're, you, you know this is these things matter to people, and you have to explain to them what you're doing, why you're doing it, and in some cases, you know, look at different ways of doing things to, to cope with local concerns. So busy. Are you out in the field very often? Well, I try and get out as much as possible because, you know, it's one thing sitting in, a, in an office or in this case, sitting at home, which I, you know, we split my time between the office and home dealing with e- emails. But it's much better if you can go and meet people, if you can if you can show them things, if you can, you know, talk, talk face to face. And of course, getting out and about, you also meet all of our amazing staff who are actually, you know, running. We think about people running a surge works and you imagine them, you know, perhaps clocking on at eight in the morning and clocking off at five in the afternoon or four in the afternoon. But they're also out there at two in the morning in, the, in, in pouring rain, trying to mend things and you know, make things work properly. So it, it's very much a 24-7 business and, and getting out and meeting people and understanding what they do then makes it easier for me to explain it to, to customers. That makes sense. I asked you to do some pre-questions before we came on. And I've got here that you focus on the key issues of the environment, corporate responsibility and response to climate change. 
And I was I was interested. I'd like to poke about the climate change mm-hmm. because it feels like Thames Water is very local in terms of like a global scale. How does the climate change, how does the climate crisis, this is such a global issue, how does Thames Water, how does the pathway come into that? Well, I think the first thing to say is that we've actually been uh, measuring our carbon emissions since 1990. So one of the first companies to do that. So we've got a very long track record of of, of, of measuring, monitoring and reducing carbon. Um, in recent years, the biggest step change we've made is by purchasing 100% renewable electricity. So even though it would be cheaper sometimes to have conventional electricity, we go for 100% re- renewable. And that gets our carbon footprint down. Great. And then there's a lot of things we can do. And one of the problems is that as you need to supply more water and you need to supply water at a higher quality sometimes you need you need more energy to, to, to for further treatment processes similarly mm-hmm. if you're cleaning up wastewater to a higher standard for instance if you're taking out phosphorus which is bad for the environment doing that requires more energy and more chemicals so you have to take a judgment on how these things are done but there's a lot of and we're doing basic things like energy efficiency in all in all our buildings uh, moving to electric vehicles but there's a lot more things we can do. So we have one of our biggest energy costs is, is pumping. Water is heavy stuff to move around, and you can't transmit it at high voltage like electricity or high pressure like gas. It is what it is, and it's heavy to pump. So and in a very flat area like ours, it doesn't very often go downhill. You've then got to push it back uphill again. So there's a lot of pumping required. Mm-hmm. So we're gradually replacing all our pumps. So, so rather than being on or off and on and off all the time, they're, they're now variable speed so that the pumps can be just enough to keep things moving. That's clever. And that keeps your energy bills down. It also oh. makes the pumps last longer because all that clunk, clunk, start, stop is wearing on the pumps. If you can just gradually move move the amount of pumping up and down as a variable speed, a bit like putting your foot on the accelerator in a car, Mm. Which isn't the way a pump traditionally works, then you can you can save energy. We're also doing a lot of remote monitoring now, so we know exactly how much all of our pumps are using, how much energy our pumps are using at any given time, and that's really good because you can you can optimize it and be, be more efficient. But it also actually tells us about the pump. If you've got a pump that for no good reason seems to be using more energy, actually. It might need the bearings replaced. It might be about to block. There could be a problem. So, you know, you can look at your energy use and send people out to go and fix the problem if, before it gets gets to the point where it's interrupting the supply to customers. But then the other part of the equation is we have a lot of capacity to generate renewable energy. So all this lovely uh, sewage sludge that our customers give us every day, free of charge, comes to the pipes at the sewage works. Yeah. If we can get that um, settled out and extracted quickly, uh, while it's as fresh as possible, we can ge- generate the most energy from it. So we've been generating energy from sewage since the 1930s, as it happens. Um, gas lights in, in, in Twickenham were powered by Mogden Sewage Works in the 30s. Were they really? <laughs> we've gradually wow. got better and better at anaerobic digestion. <laughs> and to show you how things change, there was a time when we were able to do anaerobic digestion at a smaller and smaller scale. Mm. So smaller and smaller sewage works would have their own anaerobic digesters, which all sounds mm. great. But then there's a kind of leap forward in technology, which is a new front end that you can put on anaerobic digestion called thermal hydrolysis. And what that does is it uses high pressure steam to actually crack the cell walls of the sewage, thereby wow. releasing. 10 to 15 percent more energy wow but thermal hydrolysis is a sort of chemical engineering process and you can't do it on a small scale <laughs> but we've now changed the strategy so now rather than having smaller and smaller works we have big sludge centers with this thermal hydrolysis and we bring the sludge from the smaller works in by tanker dewater it if it by tanker and then bring it to a, a, a one of our sludge centers oxford basingstoke a few others and there we can get the maximum amount of of, of energy wow. and we we use that energy ourselves to drive combined heat and power engines but increasingly we are taking the process one stage further cleaning the gas up and injecting it back into the grid huh. so you know 
to be basic about it, what you flush down the toilet one day, maybe maybe powering your gas cooker the next. Wow. Um, so that's going quite well. Um, and there's, there's still more we can do to optimize that process. But we also have um, quite a bit quite a bit of land. And some of that land we know we're going to need to expand onto in the future as population grows and potentially as we have to have more more um, land available for new processes. But in the meantime, we can put solar panels on it. So we have a lot of solar panels. And the other thing is we have lots of, well, we have 26 major storage reservoirs. And we've got floating solar panels going on to those. We tested this at um, one of our London reservoirs a year or two ago. And I think it's now the second or third biggest floating solar array in the world. Wow. And that generates energy, which again powers the pumping in that uh, reservoir and water treatment works. And potentially in the future, we'll be able to export that energy. Mm. And then there's another thing we can do too, which is with waste heat. If you think about a fairly small, a fairly dense urban area, the sewage coming from people's houses, from showers, from baths, got quite a lot of warmth in it. If you think about it, when you when you when you let the water out of the shower or the bath, it's not cold. It's 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 got a reasonable degree of warmth. And if it's only a short distance to the sewage works, it's quite a lot warmer than ambient temperature when it arrives at the works. Mm. So potentially, we can use heat exchange technology. To generate heat from there and wow. put it into into um, area heating grids. So we've got oh. one we're working working uh, on down in Kingston at the moment, which potentially will power a hospital and a, uh, a housing estate. That's still, so some way to, still some way to go, and not always the easiest thing to do. But the principle that if you've got waste heat, why wouldn't you recover it? Yeah. So you know th- these are the kind of things that are moving us forwards. And then if you look to the longer term, we talked about the, the, once we've digested the sludge to get the energy out of it, what's left is a, a, a valuable waste product because it's good as a soil conditioner and it's actually got some phosphorus and nitrogen. It's, it's, it's got some fertilizing potential. Mm. The problem is it's also got everything else that you've taken out of the sewage, including things like microplastic, including yes. antimicrobial resistant bacteria, and right. the question about whether in the long term we want to be putting that onto farmland because you're just putting more and more microplastics on. Okay, it's, it's not a huge amount, but it's building up year on year. Mm. So what we're looking at now is when we've done the first anaerobic digestion to get the gas, mm. potentially we can have a second stage on called gasification, which is where you <laughs> use some heat, uh, again, cook things under, under pressure. And you get a second lot of gas called syngas, which again you can you can use in different ways, and you can vary the, the proportion of hydrogen and methane and things by the way you the way you do the cooking, basically. And so that gives you a lot more energy. Uh, and then what you've got left with is a much smaller amount of residue, which is so so dense doesn't need to go to farmland. Um, it can actually be reprocessed into the circular economy. You can even recover metals from it. You can recover phosphorus. Wow. Um, it's concentrated enough to be recycled. Now, there's a lot of technical issues in that, but if we look at the future of the land bank and the needs for energy, needs for a circular economy, that's something that we and other water companies are increasingly looking at. These are some of the kind of challenges that you know that come to a water company. But equally, we're doing this. It's all got to, it's all got to make sense for customers. This isn't another income stream for us. It's it's a it's a way of keeping bills down. It's a way of of, of minimizing our, our carbon footprint. Mm. So all of that has to be worked through in a way that's that, that's consistent and, and appropriate for a water and wastewater company. Mm. My gosh, that was such a journey. Thank you. That's so interesting. I had no idea that there was so many different stages that you could like the potential of it. So how, how long have you been at your role for? Have you seen all of these processes happen or were they already ongoing? I've been in the job for about this this and related roles for about 20 years. Okay, so you've seen so quite seen, a lot. I've seen quite happening. a lot changing. I've seen seen things that, well, the best example is the Thames Tideway Tunnel, yes. which you know, I remember writing the first board paper in 2004, which I found recently, which was quite oh, amusing. Really? And oh. it basically said... You know, listen, guys, we're going to have to build this. Uh, we better start working out how. 
Um, <laughs> it needs it needs doing. It was very clear it needed doing because there'd been a big a big study, so it wasn't a blinding glimpse of the obvious. But mm. um, but see it from literally a paper going to the board to being mm. able to walk in the tunnel and in a year, maybe slightly longer time, to actually have a fully functioning Thames Tideway tunnel. It's been a fascinating journey. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. So the first report that you wrote in 2004. Well, it, it was the first time that it went to the board uh, you know, of, of the company. There'd been lots of discussions about you know, the, 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 the problem was known at privatisation in 1989, that you know, the, the combined sewer system in London was discharging too often into the river and was holding back the environmental quality of the tidal river. Mm. But at the time, it was regarded as too expensive. There were lots of things that needed doing to get drinking water to European standards, to improve mm. uh, sewage treatment works. And n- nobody was really wanting to take on this big problem of discharges to the river. But then something called the Thames Tideway Strategic Study was set up under an independent chair and lots of uh, my colleagues, Environment Agency, off what GLA, others were all involved in looking at what were the different ways that you could deal with the problem. And in the end, it was decided that the best way would be a tunnel. Um, and then there was a, a long delay. And actually, it was the, in 2007 that um, the then water minister, a man called Ian Pearson, took the decision that really we'd just got to get on with it. Yeah. Um, and at that it's point, we then enough. started doing doing the... Well, the, the, the difficult bit, which was talking to communities, explaining why we were going to have to build really big shaft sites right outside their houses in some cases, a lot of disruption, yeah. um, and, and and then working uh, on the design. And then we, we, we went for um, competitive tendering for a company to actually deliver, the, 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 to, to raise the money so that it wasn't, it wasn't Thames Water raising the money. It was a, a newly formed company called Tideway. Um, and they, we also went out for to tender for the three construction contracts. Um, so everything was independently tendered, and what that meant was that we got the job done for a very good price. So at one stage, the government estimates of the likely cost of the tunnel was seventy to seventy-five pounds on bills, which was a frightening thought for for, for anyone. But by mm. competitively tendering the financing and the construction and government guarantee, which very helpfully reduced the risks, meant people were prepared to accept a lower rate of return. And actually, it looks like it's going to be done for about £20 on bills. And in case anybody thinks that's £20 more, that £20 is already in bills. It's been, oh. it's been in there as the tunnel's been, been, been constructed. But huh. of the £400 or so that our customers pay for their bill, about 20 uh, is 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 the tunnel how interesting so let's this is a great segue can you tell us a little bit for anyone that isn't too sure what is the tunnel and why is it being built in the 1850s london's sewage system wasn't coping with the it, it had been built in a very informal way all through the sort of 18th and, and early 19th century. And what had happened was that the natural drainage of the city, the, the rivers like the Ravensbourne and the Fleet and others, had been sort of co opted as a sewer system. So once the flushing toilet was invented, you suddenly, people no longer had cesspits. They, were, they, were, they wanted to flush, flush and forget. And that was the whole aim of the invention of the, the water closet, as it was called. <laughs> that all ended up in these little, little little tiny streams and rivers. That ended up in the river. And you think, well, you know, it's a big river, but actually it's a tidal estuary. So although the, the water goes one way quite fast, it then turns around when the tide turns, it comes back again. Okay. So actually, whatever you put in the river stays trapped there for about mm. a month in the winter and up to three months in the summer. So the Thames had got to a really horrible state. The man called Sir Joseph Bazalgette, produced various schemes to deal with this. And finally, the, the Treasury of the day said, yes, you better get on with this because Parliament had moved itself to Oxford because the stench was so bad. And it was becoming a, a na- national disgrace. And Basiljet looked at what he could do to deal with the problem. And the problem really was that you had the, the rainwater and the foul sewage completely mixed together. So 
what he would what he wanted to do and what we would always want to do is keep surface water out of the sewers and have a separate system but what he found was that it was already so inextricably mixed that he couldn't separate it with the technology that he had at his disposal mm. so what he said was right well, we'll accept the situation and what we'll do is we will intercept the combined flows before they reach the river so it would flow down to the river and then it would go into uh, his big in- interceptor sewers which were i mean made of brick he used 320 million bricks um, he designed his own waterproof cement uh, mortar to use wow. which uh, had never, never been done done before and it was a, a marvelous feat of engineering but even then he recognized that there would be some times when you'd get so much rainfall falling off what were then cobbled streets and newly you know paved roads mm. that, that the system wouldn't always be able to cope so he built strategic overflow points because he cleaned up the river massively and every now and again about four times a year in fact there was going to be an overflow into the river but that was a small price to pay for having you know a, a, a massive improvement yeah, and he course. built 56 of these overflow points all the way down the tidal river from sort of Chiswick right 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 down beyond where the Thames barrier is now down 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 to Deptford and places like that uh, and Dartford and over time um, he, he he designed the system L- London's population at the time was 2 million and he f- said to his team well look it's only going to get bigger so let's design for 4 million uh, the trouble is we're now at 8 9 million <laughs> A few what's more. happened is that what happened is the discharges that were only going off very occasionally were going off many times every year, and this was causing worse and worse problems for the river. Mm. So various options were looked at, including one of which was: could you separate it all out? Could you do what Battlejet wasn't able to do? And the answer was: well, no, because some of these sewers you'd have to be rebuilding were absolutely massive, and doing that right. under the streets of London would, would, would have been impossible. And then we looked at, well, could you do this with sustainable drainage? Could you have areas where you would park the stormwater and sewage on the surface and deal with it more slowly? And if we'd been in a completely rural kind of greenfield situation, the answer is probably yes. But again, not in central London. So the solution was to build a deep tunnel underneath the river. And then when the interceptors overflow, they wouldn't overflow to the river it overflowed to the new tunnel. Mm. And the new tunnel started at, at Chiswick, and it started as close to the surface as you could safely get it, which is about 30 metres, so well underneath the underground and not going to damage foundations. And then it, there's a, the gradient uh, down to Beckton Sewage Works where it gets pumped out. There's a magic engineering number of about one in 800 and if it's a gradient of one in 800 it will be self-cleansing if you make it much deeper than that you get uh, turbulence and a a lot of pressure at the bottom end much shallower and it silts up so that kind of set the level of 30 meters at one end and nearly 80 meters at at, at the other and of the 56 overflows from basil jet's day some have been blocked up and aren't used. Some have been combined. And we, we ended up with 26 points at which the existing overflows will now go to, to the tunnel. So what happens in a big storm is the tunnel fills up and then it gradually gets pumped out at Beckton Surge Works at the bottom end. So it's a very long, thin storage tank, basically. And the, the first phase, um, which deals with the... Um, the biggest of all the combined overflows, which was just by the Olympic Park, actually, on the Channel Sea Creek on the River Lee, that's been completed. That was done a few years ago. It's four miles long, and that's and that's working. And what's happened is that is is that interesting. That some fish surveys were done recently, and there's a, now a thriving f- fish population in the Channel Sea Creek, which used to be very heavily polluted. So once the whole tunnel is complete, which will be sometime next year, and has then been commissioned. We don't know quite how long that will take, because it depends on what the weather does. Um, the discharges to the river will be more or less a thing of the past. There'll still be a few occasions when even the new tunnel will be beaten. We looked at how big you'd need to make it to never have a discharge, and it became completely uneconomical to do that. So we think that probably 
four to six times a year, there'll be a discharge of some sort. Okay. But it'd still be capturing 95% of what goes in the river. It's amazing. The other thing is a phenomenon we call the first flush. So if you've had a long dry period, you will have quite a lot of nastiness that will have settled out in the bottom of the sewers. And then you have a sudden summer thunderstorm or a very wet week. All of that gets pushed out by the, the first flush of water. That's the bit that causes the most environmental damage. Now, all of that will be captured in the tunnel. And then once it's been flushed out, what's coming through after that is mainly rainwater. So you know, you've not only have you captured 95%, you've captured much the most polluting bit. So we are going to see a really big difference. in, in It'll still look a bit sort of sandy and silty because it's a tidal estuary and it moves up and down. And it's got lots of suspended solids in it. But what it won't do is it won't have the um, uh, the oxygen demand. It, 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 you won't you won't get the occasional fish kills. You, you won't get the barrier to fish migration that was created by deoxygenated water moving up and down the river. So it's 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 a it's a really big scheme. It's taken a very long time. Uh, it's caused a lot of disruption. It's put a lot of money on bills, but it, it will it will solve the problem. Mm, wow. Amazing. You're so good at telling a story. It's so engaging to listen to you. That was, and I can totally see how that would be such an achievement in your career and this job as well. Well, it wasn't my achievement. All I was saying is in terms of, you, you asked what I'd seen over 20 years, and that's something that's yeah. been really interesting to watch. I mean, but you're part of the puzzle. Many, many, many thousands of people have, have, have worked on it in different, in different, in different ways. It's, it's a massive project. Yeah. Um, but just to have been being able to, to watch it at close quarters is a, is a, is a, is a real privilege and it'll be, it'll be great to see it working. Absolutely. So just in terms of like London's population growth, say 50 years from now, will this tunnel be enough to sustain? Well, that's a really important point. Um, it will be, but only if we make sure that all new development is done to a very high standard of sustainable drainage. I see. So if people build lots more big tower blocks and connect all the surface water into the sewers within you know 30 years we'll need another tunnel which is ridiculous so we're working really hard with the mayor of london and all the boroughs to make sure that when there is new development it's done to a very high standard um if i give you an example there was a development and i won't name it um a few years ago on the banks of the thames and the developers announced that they were going to be connecting the surface water into the sewers, which they had a perfect right to do. And we said, but excuse us, but this is right on the banks of the river. Why don't you simply take the surface water and put it in the river and keep it out of our sewers, which, by the way, are already very full? And they said, ah, but that'd be more expensive. And we got the absolute right to connect. And it actually took the mayor of London, who at the time was one Boris Johnson, to say in his inimitable fashion, you know, they better get this sorted out or I'm not giving planning permission. And, you know, that the power of City Hall was sufficient to get them to do a plan, spend the extra money, put the surface water in the river, keep it out of the sewers. But we're relying on the boroughs and the mayor to keep doing that for every new development, to, to make absolutely certain that surface water is surface water. Foul sewage, we can cope with that. But we really don't want any, any more surface water uh, making the problem worse. Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. I so I went onto my Instagram and I put up a poll and my Instagram audience is fairly neutral. The majority is from London. Yeah. And I asked the question, do people know what the Thames Tideway tunnel is? Mm. And fifty eight percent said they hadn't. And then it made me begin to think and I was wondering if there's any plans in the works to raise public un understanding yeah. of the tunnel and its benefits. We've tried really hard, Chloe, over, over the whole of the sort of 20 years that, that I've been, been follow, following this. It is just very difficult to get people to take an interest in something which is, is underground. It's got no moving parts. Mm. It's got no branding. You know, you, ca you, can't, you can't drive it. Uh, you can't paint it pretty <laughs> colours. You know, there's, there's nothing, nothing about and, – and actually, people won't see any difference. Yes. Most of them. And their lives will be exactly the same. They're still mm. flush and forget. Um, the people who will see a difference are people like the Zoological Society of London researchers who monitor the quality of the river. 
people will start seeing more marine mammals coming up through 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 London. There'll be less of the occasional fish kills, and London will once again have one of the cleanest metropolitan rivers in the world. Um, but getting people to understand how it's been done, they're not just they're, not, they're just not that interested. Mm. You know, we've we've tried various various ways of raising interest, but but what people tend to say is, yeah, it's very interesting, but it's your job. Just just get on with it. You know, don't put too mm-hmm. much on the bill. Um, the people who are interested are the people who, who care about engineering or infrastructure, the people who know about the lost rivers of London, uh, you mm-hmm. know, uh, people who go mudlarking, people who are canoeing, um, you know, the, the, the rowers. Those are the people who will see more of a benefit. But in trying to get, I mean, I'm, you know, it, it would be lovely that, to think that all of the people on your poll would have said, yes, of course, I know, and I know what it's about. But you can't can't force people to take an interest in things. You can do your best mm. to, you know, to attract their attention. But people have got an awful lot of other things going on in their lives and worrying about where their sewage goes, um, particularly when you're solving a problem. If, you, if, mm. if, 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 if you know, When we had the original problem and things were getting worse, people were very quick to say, you know, get on and do something. And now, you know, we're doing it. And that's some people a bit of a shrug of the shoulders. Well, why wasn't it done sooner? And why is it so expensive? And, um, those are the kind of questions they're entitled to ask because ultimately they're paying for it. Yes, that makes sense. So I I asked more questions from the public and one of them I just like to pull out mm-hmm. now. Uh, and I, I think, as you said, like people like who canoe or mudlarkers or people that are interested in construction, I think this person would sort of fit into this genre or this echo chamber perhaps. And they said, I love sewers. Can they make them more open access so people can get a sense of them? Mm. And when I first read this, I laughed because I thought, why would you want to get a sense of a sewer? Mm. But on revision, this is an interesting lead. Do you think if sewers were more accessible, let's say more yeah. like visible, do you think this would improve the public understanding for the strategy behind them? I, I think it might, but I think the people who would want to go down the sewers are the people who are who are already interested. Mm. And we do it, I have periodically taken people down into the sewers, and it's a very difficult, labour-intensive thing to do because not only have people got to have all the right right equipment, um, they you know they've got to be ready in case there's a build-up of gas that down below. You've got to get people out quickly. And the other thing is because you've got a combined sewer, you know, if you do have a heavy rainstorm, you could, the flows can suddenly increase. And you may be walking along knee deep or ankle deep one minute, and the next wow. minute it's over. You know, it's coming through quite fast. So, just getting people down there and showing them, it takes a lot of trained Thames Water people to go down with them. Um, mm. it's, it's quite a performance. So, we would tend to want to do things with with video. And, and, and I mean, the Thames Tideway Tunnel team, I know, are working on a big visitor centre, which will be a sort of visitor experience, which will be which will be good. Um, just yeah, you know, getting people down there it's 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 not that easy and it's not that safe that's that's mm. the out of curiosity the people that you have taken down there what's their reaction well the first the first thing is they say this brick brick this brickwork looks amazing when did you replace it and we say no no that's the original brickwork from 1858 oh, really? that's <laughs> because, pretty cool of course being down underground uh, it's not had any acid rain it hasn't been reversed into by buses you know Nothing's taken lumps out of it. It literally looks as good as the day it was built. Huh. Um, so that's one, one, one of the things. The next thing is they're always surprised it doesn't smell because actually when you keep sewage moving, it doesn't smell. It smells when it when it sits around. Oh, so there's yeah. very little smell. And if you you know, it's you go up, we you took took people down in in Kensington un, un, underneath the French embassy. People said they could smell the garlic. Um, but, oh my gosh. Um, there is there is very little smell down there. The other thing is they notice, I'm afraid, is the huge amount of wet wipes that are washing along, mm. plus the occasional nappies, tights, sanitary products, all the unflushables. Yeah. Um, and then they meet our sewer gangs who are known as known as flushers, and they talk to them about what happens when you get a fatberg, which is when you get wet wipes and other unflushables mixed with fat. It starts to, starts to block the sewer. And then people have to go down there with pickaxes and high pressure hoses to hack it all out. Oh, so again, taking people down when they when they see what's flowing down the sewer, uh, not not very nice. And you can get the same 
effect of when you take people to a sewage work. So Beckton Sewage Treatment Works treats, treats the waste of between two and a half and three million people every day. It's the biggest works in Europe. And we collect up 30 tons of wet wipes every day, every day at Beckton. And they have to go off to landfill. When people That's see great. these skips full of stuff that, you know, shouldn't have been flushed. Um, and when they see sort of, you know, wet wipe reefs forming in the river, um, they understand why, why we're working so hard to try and get the, 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 the non-flushable message across. Mm, you know, absolutely. The system wasn't designed to cope with plastic. Plastics hadn't been invented when we were when the sewers were built. No, too true. I suppose now that the the tideway tunnels coming in, things like the Hammersmith, the wet wipe mountain, is that what they call well, it? It won't get any. It won't. It won't get any worse because because the, 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 the new the, the the tunnel will collect all of that up, so it won't it won't be mm. it won't be washing out into the river, and. What people tend to say is, well, why couldn't you screen the existing CSOs better? And in some cases, we do have got some screens, but you can't make the screens too small because the, the power of, of what's coming out of there, given that it's mostly rainwater, we've got a huge push coming through, and any screen would just be washed away. So by capturing it, taking it to Beckton, pumping it out, we can screen it there. So, the, but it won't take away the existing wet white reefs, and we, we'd love to try and work with the TLA and others to see if there might, might not be a way of getting the river back the way it was and getting those wet wipes out. But of course, it can get a little bit complicated because that's become become new habitat. You know, you've got invertebrate life in 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 in, in there. You, you need to be quite careful what you do in the river to make sure you don't you know solve one problem and cause another. Yeah, absolutely. Another question that we got from the public was, can they, so can Thames Water, appoint different people to their board, e.g. surfers against sewage? Well, we'd certainly listen to surfers against sewage. Um, and one of the things that we've done recently is we've published a live map of where sewage discharges are taking place. And surfers against sewage actually helped with the final design of that of that that map one of the groups that we that we consulted the board of the company is really about the overall direction it's how we meet government requirements it's how we meet regulatory requirements it's how we raise how we raise the money how we deliver the services and you, the boards of big companies tend to have people who know how to do those things on them but what the board then does is it appoints executives people like me and others who've got expertise in particular areas and then tells us to, to get on with it and monitors what we do and sets targets for us. And it's people like me who want to go out and talk to Surface Against Sewage and see what we can do. Mm. So their voice is certainly heard and there's lots of ways of getting a voice heard without actually having a seat on the board, which isn't always, I have to say, the most exciting thing when you look at the, the board papers, what, what the board have to look at. Some some of it is it's fairly dry stuff about you know in, in investment investment rates and mm -hmm. regulatory compliance and things. It's it's very important, and it's often people who've got a lot of experience in smaller companies or other sectors who bring their advice to us. But we do have former water minister Ian Pearson, who was a, a labour a labour MP and water minister. He's on our board, and we have people who have worked in various. Uh, retail environments worked in other utility businesses so there's a lot of broad experience on the on the board but it's it's also it's the whole executive team which which goes out and engages with stakeholders so when i'm out you know talking to people i'm also listening and i'm i'm feeding that back in and i'm saying you know i think we've got an issue here or i think we need to do this properly or you know people are pretty happy with this but actually they're really really unhappy with that Mm. And that's 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 part of the job is 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 is, yeah. is is to be a link to the outside world, and that's so important as well. Listening yeah. to the community, yeah. I like that. The next question we have got: How can they again? How can Thames Water set new governance and hold themselves to account for the pollution? Well, it's not just us holding. I mean, everyone's holding us to account for for, for pollution. I think we need to separate it out into two into two bits. One is the pollution that's caused by something going wrong. So this is a, a catastrophic failure of a piece of machinery. It's somebody, doesn't happen very often, but somebody who does something does something wrong, 
pushes the switch left when it should have should have gone right. It, it, it's it, it it's it's where um, there's a failure of some sort. Perhaps we use the wrong chemical. Those are pollution incidents, and and they are uh, we get get we get prosecuted for the, for those incidents. We end up in we end up in court, uh, and we get we get potentially um, heavily fined. Then there are the situations where the infrastructure is working the way it was designed to operate. So this is where, for instance, we've got the combined sewer overflows in London, which are designed to go to the river in certain circumstances when the sewers are full, because the alternative would be that sewage. If we blocked up the overflow, the sewage would back up into the streets, houses, the underground, homes, businesses, quite literally in vast volumes. So that's the infrastructure working the way it's permitted to do. We don't think that's acceptable. So we've said that any untreated sewage uh, going going into rivers is unacceptable. The question then is, well, okay, so if it's unacceptable, what are you doing about it? Well, the first thing is to tell people it's unacceptable, and we think it is. The second thing is to open up. Where is it happening? Why is it happening? How much is it happening? How can you find out? So we've got this live map now. We're the only company to have done this. We're years ahead of the rest of the industry on that. And we're also very open in ex- responding to requests for environmental information. But the much more important part is what are we doing to clean up? So we've got a lot of our works which are already planned for expansion to, to cope with additional flows, make reduced discharges, bringing some of that work forward. Uh, and we're planning a lot, a lot more of it. And we're also outside London where you've got a separate sewer network and a surface water network, you can get crossovers between between the two. And I won't go into hows and whys, but either way, it's bad. They're designed to be separate. And so what we're doing there is a lot of work to uh, to work out where these misconnections are. It's very difficult. We've got 110,000 kilometers of sewers that you have to work your way around. You find out which, which are the worst bits. Um, mm-hmm. And then you start making sure that, that they're operating properly, that there are no defects. It, it, it's a continuous it's a continuous process, but we have to recognize that having said that it's unacceptable, and I'll, I'll stand by that, we are operating a system that's been designed that way for 150 years. And much as I would love to say, you know, um, all it will take is some money, give us, give us another X billion pounds and we'll sort it. It, it, it just isn't as simple as that. You know, we, we, there's a lot of rhetoric about sewage dumping. Well, nobody's nobody's dumping sewage. What's happening is when the system is full to capacity, it's overflowing, and that's bad. But what you've got to try and work out is which are the worst bits, which bits are we going to do first, how much can we afford to do in a certain period, actually, how much construction capacity is there? Is there how many companies are there that can do the, that can do this work? And and then linked to that is where where are the worst places for these discharges to happen? Uh, so into a into a chalk stream, site of special scientific interest, just upstream of a bathing water area. Those are the places where we, we where we need mm. to get this done most quickly into the highest standard. And mm. over time, we want to get these make these discharges a thing of the past. But it, mm. it's not going to be quick or easy, and it would be wrong for me to pretend that it is. What's your opinion on when we look at sewage spills into the foreshore of the ocean? Mm. I was wondering if you look at the Thames Tideway Tunnel, is this could this be a solution on like a larger scale? The coastal pollution. Yes. Um well in the sense in the sense that it would be the, the thing about the Thames Tideway Tunnel is it is it's is it's it's linear. Otherwise you'd just build a tank. And the fact that it's linear uh, uh over well it will be twenty miles when it's finished is is really important because when you look at the kind of heavy monsoon type downpours we get these days, they're quite localized. You may, you may find that the worst downpour is, 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 is on a mile, on an area only half a mile or a mile across. Other mm-hmm. parts just get, just get rain, but you can get torrential. So the tunnel, the benefit is that anywhere down the whole length of the tunnel that gets the most extreme flow downpour, you've got the whole volume of the tunnel available to take it. So it's, it's sort of distributed. If you were doing the same thing with sustainable drainage, you'd have to have sustainable drainage all the way down the 20 miles of the tunnel. 
whereas wherever the rain falls, the tunnel can connect it. So, But for a coastal situation, you'd be better off um, if you decided to go down this route, just building a big tank, a big storage tank. But people always, it's, it's easy to think that more storm tanks, as we call them, would be the answer. But the problem is it, it's not that difficult to build more tanks, and it's certainly not difficult to fill them. But you've got to get them empty because once they're full, you've got a fairly short opportunity to get them empty and treated before the contents go black and stinking and septic. And you really don't want to be standing next to a storm tank that's got 10-day-old sewage in it. So you, you have to increase the treatment capacity of the works in line with the storage available in your storm tanks. So the two mm-hmm. things have to go have to go hand in hand. Otherwise, you, you build up a problem for yourself. Mm, I understand. That makes sense. Okay. And finally, looking at the future. So I calculated it's 165 years ago we had the Great Stink. Mm-hmm. And it was a, almost 100 years later in 1957, so 66 years ago from now, the River Thames was declared dead. Mm. And today, in 2023, it's beaming with wildlife. Mm. What is yours and Thames Water's vision for 200 more years into the future? Well, I think the rivers bounce. I mean, nature does bounce back really well, provided you take take your foot off her neck, you know. So um, the comeback in the river from the 60s, quite a lot of that was, was, was due to business and industry, particularly heavy manufacturing industry, moving out of London so that the you got to a point where the only really damaging discharges to the river, ultimately, thanks to the environmental legislation and, and, as I say, the businesses moving out, the sewage discharges were the last really serious remaining source of pollution in the river. Now, once we've got the Thames Tideway Tunnel built and operational, that will deal with, with that problem. I think then um, we then want to start working on, on, on what can we do, first of all, to make sure that we don't slip back. So new development's got to be to a very high standard. How can we then take advantage of the opportunities? Can we get more people safely onto the foreshore? Well, that's a matter for the PLA, not, not, not for us. But then there are still some surface water overflows into the river, some of which have um, misconnect, misconnections from houses, foul drainage. There's a lot, lot of problems to, to sort out there. We have to make sure that we don't have blockages in sewers. So things that we're doing with, we're fitting depth monitors in our sewers, so that and they're all connected up through artificial intelligence. So if you find, let's say you've got six monitors in an area, and one of them says, my level's really high, and the other five say, we're all normal, you've got a pretty good indication that there could be a blockage. So mm-hmm. you can get in and sort that out. So we, we need to get much better at monitoring the network. The other thing is that although the Thames Tideway Tunnel was developed to do a very specific job, which is to catch the storm discharges and hold them till they can be treated, it may be possible to use it in different ways. We may be able to take the edge off some of the surface water flooding that we can get in severe conditions by the way we operate it, by you know moving sewage around in the system to take up to take advantage of, of of low levels in some areas, high levels and up. So we call it real time control. You're actually mm-hmm. much more in control of the situation rather than just water and sewage rushing from one end to the other. So um and I think working with the PLA, with the Environment Agency, getting those last remaining discharges sorted out is important. I'd love to be able to find a way of dealing with the sort of the wet wipe reefs um, (laughs) and also getting Londoners more connected with the river because if people Mm. feel connected to something, they'll they'll, they'll care about it um, and and they'll look after it. So um, I'd love to see wet wipes banned. Certainly wet wipes, any plastic at all, and just just ban them. We don't don't need them. Um, And... Again, it's very high standards for developers too. So, so working working with developers, with councils, to make sure that everybody recognises that what we flush ultimately you know, need, need, needs to go to a sewage works and not mm. by any chance to, to a river. So there's there's lots and lots more work to be done. Um, but if we can show people, you know, you were talking about how you persuade people that all this stuff is a good idea, but well, it's actually by showing the benefits. 
So we have to gradually get get more and more people in, involved, getting getting young people into into to rowing and sailing and canoeing. It'll always be dangerous to swim in the Thames it, through London. I mean, I know there will, be, there will be people who will do it, and our people will do it, but the currents are so strong that you can't do much about that. But we can certainly make it much more pleasant to to be on the foreshore, um, and 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 make make the river what it should be again, which is this sort of jewel in London's crown. Yeah, it's lovely. That's such a nice way of encapsulating this conversation as well. Have you got any take home messages to our listeners? I think, you know, ultimately the river has to be everybody's responsibility. It's us, it's the PLA, it's the GLA, it's the Environment Agency, it's all the companies, but it's also all of all, all of Londoners need to, need, need to be proud of their river. And, you know, it's just the basic things of making sure, which I know is a job for councils, but then people people vote for councils. So the individual voices count, making sure that new developments have, have really good separated drainage uh, and you know, preferably banning, but certainly if we don't ban wet wipes, then then if you're going to use them, put them put them in the bin. Yeah, uh, they don't they don't need to end up going down the toilet, potentially blocking the sewer. If they don't block a sewer, uh, potentially getting washed out onto the foreshore. We just we just don't need that, and it's it's fairly basic to to put it in the bin. But that's an an, an education point. We actually had the same take home message about the wet wipes from a mudlarker. Mm. So it's very true. Yeah, maybe. Do, I wonder if they put it on the packaging. They probably do. Well, the, the trouble is there is a lot of wet wipes are marked as flushable. Now, as our previous chief That's executive right. used to say, you can flush half a house brick if you try hard enough. doesn't mean it's a good <laughs> idea. So what we as an industry did was we produced something called the fine-to-flush standard. Okay. And if it's a fine-to-flush standard, that will break down. Uh, okay. But the fact that it just says flushable, Unless it's fine to flush, it's a very, uh, you know, you need, need to be really careful. And that's why we're trying to work on the supermarkets, work on the manufacturers, work on the government. Because actually, it's not really fair to rely on individual customers to, to read the label and understand what it means. And mm. Nice if they do, and we'll certainly help them. But actually, this is surely a case where government needs to step in and say, actually, this, you, we don't need to have wet wipes of plastic in them. Mm. Yeah, they did this with the straws, and then they put the five p charge onto plastic bags. Mm. But there needs to be a bigger movement, really. I think so. Yeah, and governments, they perhaps you know, the thing about the governments is they have to get re-elected. But um, I, I still think there's a lot more that could be done in terms of you know returnable packaging, glass glass bottles. It always seems very difficult to get a deposit scheme going, but you know. I remember, I'm old enough to remember when you could get 5p back on, on a bottle of Coke. You know. Oh, really? Uh, yes, you could. I promised you one many, many years ago. I don't wow. think it's impossible if people put their minds to it, but um, that's not for me. That's for government. Well, Richard, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you today. Thank you so much for all your insight and knowledge. Yeah, it's been really lovely. Okay, enjoyed it, Chloe. Thank you very much. You've now reached the end of today's episode. Thank you so much for choosing to listen to Talk of the Thames today. If you know someone that would enjoy listening to this episode, then please do share the love. This episode has been brought to you by me, Chloe Russell, on behalf of the Thames Estuary Partnership, and I most look forward to welcoming you next time.